Hey folks and welcome back. In the last video we had taken a look at of how we want to go about presenting work for our portfolio and we'd covered just some broad rules on how we want to go about laying things out. Now we're going to take a look at specific content and when we think about specific content really we need to think about the kind of job roles that we're going to go for. But just before we get into the specifics let's just take a look at some general rules when it comes to content. And really for the vast majority of roles that we're going to go for outside of the very technical ones we need to deliver high quality visuals in the end regardless of the specific role you're going for we're designers who create content be it for animation for film for games we're paid for what goes on screen and what goes on screen needs to be of the highest quality so a great portfolio this is the real and the site it's going to have quality visuals that highlight your specific skill sets and hopefully it's going to have lots of eye candy because at the first 30 seconds really do need to make an impression. You need to keep in mind that studios, particularly the bigger studios, are seeing hundreds if not thousands of reels a month. Uh, so if you spend 30 seconds on some fancy intro that doesn't show me what I need to see, you know, I'm going to lose interest very quickly. So we want to make a, a good impression across the first 30 seconds. You don't need to put everything you've ever done into your reel. Often recruiters will see reels that start off really strong and progressively become worse. So including everything you've ever worked on could take you from a yes to a very clear no. That's the advantage of someone starting out, uh, a student or someone trying to get into the industry, as they generally won't have enough high quality work. And that's to your advantage, right? Uh, as a student starting out or someone looking to get into the industry, this quality over quantity mantra allows you to focus on making what you have as polished as possible. Now another common question that people ask when they're starting out is should I have a generalist reel or a specialist reel? If you're looking to go and work at one of the large companies they tend to be quite departmentalized. They're large teams and that often means that they are looking for specialists within those teams. For smaller to medium sized companies they will need more generalists. They'll need more people who can do a variety of tasks across a show or across a project. To a certain degree, the answer to this question is, you know, what kind of company do you want to go and work for? Now, when I ask students, generally they will say they want to work for the big name companies because often they're the only companies that they're actually aware of. If I could give you a piece of advice on that, it would be to start off at a smaller size company. You will gain more experience across a variety of roles so you could start off as a generalist and then when you gain more experience you could go into more specialist positions uh, however in terms of putting the portfolio together really you want to try and tailor your demo reel to the studio that you're applying for so you want to know your audience you want to tailor your job to a specific job role so you could look at the body of work the studio does and tailor your let's say animation shots or your modeling shots towards that studio. You don't want to mimic their style, but you do want to be able to show them something that they can relate to and that they can hire you for. Now that could seem like a lot of work, right? Having to tailor your stuff to all of these different companies. But thankfully there's a lot of generic work that happens across most projects. So for example, there's generally going to be a lot of vehicles in most movies. There is generally going to be military items in quite a few different types of games. For example, guns. There's generally going to be interiors and cities within most projects. So it's possible to create interesting work that can tick a lot of boxes for a lot of different companies. When you're starting out, it's very difficult to underestimate the amount of different jobs and specific roles that you would need to have to complete larger style projects. Uh, particularly larger game projects, animation projects, or film projects. You could have a crew of 300, 400, 500 people working on really, really big projects, and they'll be split up into various different departments. Each department could have 50 people within them, some of them specializing, again, within very niche areas. So it's very difficult to see that when you're starting out. This is by no means a comprehensive list of different job roles that you might have on a VFX production, for example. Uh, you can get some kind of a feel for the different job roles if you sit through the credits of a movie uh, the next time you go to the cinema. I uh, just look out for the VFX roles. But it does give you some idea that there are a lot of people with a lot of different skill sets working across a project or working across a production. 
when we're trying to put together a reel, be it a generalist reel or a specialist reel, really we should be looking at these job roles and trying to tailor our reel towards these job roles or towards these job disciplines. For the vast majority of people starting out, they're probably more in a generalist mode than a specialist mode. You know, you probably just don't have enough experience within one particular discipline. Wherever you're at, you want to focus on your best skills. If your animation or modeling is just adequate or okay, then you really need to work on making it better than average. You need to push it and polish it as much as you can. And that really is where you should be spending the majority of your time. Uh, the more you can impress people with your particular skills, be it modeling or animation, the more likely they are to consider you. Something that's important to keep in mind that students often fall down on, the studios will consider you for a role. You, you will find that they don't really care if you can only animate and you can't model, or if you can only do effects and you can't do compositing. Students often underestimate this, so for larger companies, if your modeling sucks but your animation is really good, well, just get some generic characters. You know, download one from somewhere. You know, make sure to check the licensing on it, so try and get one that's Creative Commons and that you can use to demonstrate your animation skills. Do not go and, and model a, a poorly modeled character and then animate it. Go and download a model or go and download a, a rigged model and make sure you credit whoever modeled it and rigged it and then animate away. Uh, same thing for if your animation sucks but your modeling rocks. Well, then just don't animate it. For larger companies, they really won't care. They'll be hiring you into a specific role. Where possible, we want to be highlighting our strongest skill sets. That's what we want to be focusing in on. Ideally, we will find job roles that match those skill sets. It is important to say that skills are more important than any one particular piece of software. So while software X or software Y might be the popular software of choice and you see lots of advertising for it and lots of things on forums, in the end, you get hired for your skills. It is important for companies to know what skills you have and to know what software you can use. If your core skill sets aren't up to scratch, if your animation isn't up to scratch or your modeling or whatever role you're applying for, it really doesn't make any difference what software you're using. For the larger companies, they tend to use quite a lot of proprietary tools anyway, so you won't have access to those regardless. So you, you really are selling your artistic skill set and your design skill set more than, more than your software knowledge. Now that we've talked a little bit about some general rules for how we want to go about selecting our content, Let's take a look at some hints and tips for how we might go about selecting content for particular roles. So when we're looking at the roles, generally we want to look at the more junior roles within any particular department because unless you have a lot of experience, they're the roles that you will most likely be going for. And we're going to take a look at modeling to start off. So junior modelers will often start out with modeling simple props, and then I'll move on to more complex objects and then on to hero objects from there. Modeling is sometimes an entry level role and you need to be able to demonstrate that you can model accurately a range of different objects and scenes. Uh, this is gonna require an in-depth knowledge of 3D modeling software, obviously. Uh, Maya is the standard here for animation and for VFX. Uh, 3ds Max is often used in games and is the standard for architecture visualization. Modo is also quite a strong modeler, as is Blender, but Maya is generally the backbone software for most animation and visual effects studios and more and more for game studios as well. Uh, you need to be able to show skill sets, particularly with polygon modeling. You'll need to be able to create and handle UVs. Really what we're trying to show here outside of the software skill set is that we have a refined eye, that we've got a good eye for detail, that we've got a good eye for volume and form. Uh, now, 3D models are often categorized by technique into uh, non-organic and organic modeling. Now, organic modeling, which is character modeling and creature modeling, often has quite a high profile for students or for people starting out. But prop modeling and environment modeling make up the bulk of modeling requirements for most productions. There is less character work out there than you would think, and the character work is going to go to mid and senior level artists. So you will see an awful lot of zebra stuff out there, and there you will see an awful lot of nice quality sculpts out there. Uh, but generally speaking, for students and for people starting out, it's not likely, unless you're very, very talented in that particular area, that you're going to be going into those roles at the start of your career. So that's why I tend to put an emphasis on modeling real world objects and modeling real world props. I think it's a more useful skill set to be able to show. 
If you are determined to follow the character route, I would be inclined to do an anatomy study. There tends to be a lot of fantasy-based work um, when we look at character and creature stuff, and I'd be inclined to steer away from that. I'd be inclined to do something more that's going to highlight your understanding of anatomy, so human anatomy in particular, and I'd be also inclined to do something that highlights your understanding of topology for animation. Uh, for VFX work in particular, you need to be able to model accurately. You need to recreate on-set props and locations, often using reference material. Uh, we can show our models off using turntables, and that's a good idea to do once, maybe maybe twice. Um, it can get a bit boring to see a lot of those. Uh, if you are doing characters, you should be posing them. If you're doing objects, you should be looking to pose them as well. When we're trying to display this eye for detail and volume, I think subtle movement and still renders can work quite well. Unless you are determined to go for a character role, I would definitely be steering clear of just showing characters. I would be trying to show off a variety of uh, objects and shapes, including individual props, working up to maybe an interior, uh, working up to a streetscape, maybe working up to a whole level or environment if you're going for games. I'd stay towards the more realistic stuff and maybe have a small sprinkling of some creative environment stuff, maybe a sci-fi space station or something like that. We really want to be considering our camera language when we're showing off our models. It doesn't need to be fancy. In fact, I would highly recommend not doing anything fancy. Generally, for showing the, the larger stuff, uh, the interiors, I'd be inclined to go for slow panning interior shots or crane shots. I'd be looking to Eric Viz here that's their stock in trade. So look at some ArcViz stuff and see how they go about doing it. Um, for wider environment shots, I'd be inclined to go with just for an overhead perspective shot. I would generally avoid sticking a camera on a spline. Uh, flight trues generally look a little bit naff. Uh, we can't really do that with real world cameras and the language of cinematography comes from real world cameras. So I'd be trying to avoid anything that makes me notice the camera really. Uh, unless you're going for a more generous role, you don't need to be a lighter, but you know, a general kind of basic lighting setup will go a long way to highlighting your modeling skills quite well. You could consider using an online 3D player like you might see on Sketchfab. I'm not going to be hiring you as a lighter, but basic lighting can help to show off the models quite well. Uh, for all of these roles, we'll touch briefly on who you work closely with. Again, I won't be hiring you for a texturing or a rigging role here, but it is important to understand, particularly for larger pipelines, that you will be working with texture artists and riggers and that your models will need to satisfy their requirements. Uh, so if you can hint that you have an understanding of those disciplines, um, that's probably quite a good thing to do. Uh, moving on to look at junior texturing roles, texture artists are going to be responsible for creating a variety of surface textures for our characters, our environments, or our props. So we're going to want to be able to display across our portfolio an in-depth knowledge of texturing. And traditionally that would have been Photoshop. And Photoshop is still a very useful uh, tool in this area. Uh, more and more this area has seen specialized uh, texturing software. Our, our Maori for high-end film stuff and Substance for film stuff and particularly for games. Now you're going to need to be able to show a knowledge of those software skills. But really when we're texturing, we're trying to tell the story of an object through our textures or the story of a world through our textures, uh, regardless of the specific software that you need to do to tell that story. In texturing, we're trying to highlight our artistic skills and our eye for detail. Now we can do some of that through showing off of texture sheets. So showing off the different maps that build up towards the final look. So we can show the, the 2D UV version of the maps and then show the final object. We can also show the build up using wipes. This is an artistic role mostly. You do need to have some knowledge of how the maps are going to be used in the shaders. So you are going to need to be able to test out the textures within various lighting conditions. You do have to have some understanding of what's happening over in modeling. In, in my experience of larger pipelines, uh, modeling takes care of the UVs. Now that's not always the case. Sometimes the texturing artists can be responsible for the UVs. But regardless, you'll need to be able to read UVs and have a good understanding of how UVs are laid out. You will need to have an understanding of what's trying to be achieved in look development uh, with your texture maps. On smaller productions, the role of modeler and texture artist can be combined, or sometimes the role of texture artist and look dev artist can be combined. But in particular for just a texturing role, it is mostly an artistic role. So you want to be highlighting your eye for detail, you want to have a good grasp of concepts such as composition, colour, value, form, scale, and that should be apparent in the final textured work. Often on smaller productions, modelling and texturing can be combined into one role. My general advice for both modelling and texturing assets 
would be to focus your time on developing very high quality real world assets. Uh, really, I think it is possible to nail a job with one very high quality asset that you have developed to a very high level. So here we can see an example of someone who's worked on developing a couch. So it's not some fancy spaceship with loads of parts to it. It's not some creature with loads and loads of detail. It's a couch. And there are lots and lots of props like this to be developed. And they've clearly spent a lot of time developing the model here. They're looking at references for the particular model. They're looking at different surface values on the model. They've got a good control over the types of maps that they're using. And then they're highlighting their ability to tell the story of this couch through the buildup of the textures that we see here over on the right hand side. And they're doing this to a very high level, right? This is a nicely finished asset to a high level. I'd be inclined to try and highlight those kind of skill sets because there is a lot of that type of work. And then if you want to show the more fantasy based stuff, the sci-fi stuff, the more stylized hand painted stuff, uh, you could put in some of that as well. Lighting is not generally an entry level role. Often people who have more of a generalist background and can show skills across a range of departments will be going for lighting. And that's because lighting is where all of the different elements of the shot the animation, the modeling, the texturing, etc., all come together. So often you need to troubleshoot all of those assets coming in, and that will require experience in those areas. So, but when we consider putting together elements of our portfolio that highlight our lighting skills, we we need to just be wary of the idea of photorealism. Photorealism is not really an end in and of itself, uh, particularly in animation, visual effects, and games. Really, our images should not simply just be photoreal. They need to be atmospheric. They need to be moody. They need to be cinematic. Even in the case of VFX, where we're matching to a plate, we need to not only match the photography, we need to enhance it. We, we need to advance the story. That means that lighters need to have a good eye for colour, tone and mood. And they need to be able to do this across a range of lighting scenarios and across a range of different models and a range of different surfaces. Something you could consider here to highlight this ability to handle lots of assets coming from different departments and to be able to highlight your ability to light across a variety of objects would be to light a very busy scene like we can see over here on the right where there's lots and lots of different objects that have different surface values that, so all the shaders need to be balanced up and, and then there's the build-up of the lighting itself to give the atmospheric look to the shot. Now lighters need to use their technical skills and their aesthetic judgments uh, to create images that are memorable. Now they also need to be able to render the images efficiently. So where we can, we want to demonstrate that we're comfortable with technical aspects of shading, rendering, and optimization. Uh, on a lighting reel, you might try highlighting this by showing a range of different lighting scenarios. For example, lighting volumetrics or explosions can be quite tricky, so that would highlight a technical mindset there. If you're particularly technically minded, you could highlight your shader uh, building or shader writing skill set. Lighters will work closely across quite a few departments to make sure that their shots have what they need, but in particular they work quite closely with compositing to ensure that compositing has what they need. So generally lighters will have a good understanding of the 2D compositing pipeline. So if you can highlight your ability to rebuild a beauty pass, or at least highlight your ability to output various lighting passes, that would be a good thing to do. And compositing is where all the disparate parts come together to create the final shot. So because it's near the end of the pipeline, there's a lot of pressure to get shots approved. So compositors need to work to high standards and very tight deadlines. To work in the compositing department, we should have extensive knowledge of the 2D pipeline, including compositing software such as Nuke, which is the industry standard for feature film, and After Effects, which is often used at smaller to medium sized studios and has a particular stronghold in motion graphics. You should ideally have some knowledge of the 3D pipeline as well. In particular, it's useful to understand how to use 3D cameras and to have an understanding or at least some understanding of the lighting pipeline. Now, compositors are generally senior positions uh, because you've got a lot of pressure on you to deliver high quality shots, but there are entry level roles into the compositing department. Junior artists often start out doing rotoscoping and paint work and it can be a good place to start your 2D compositing career. It really instills in you the value of high quality mats and how they're used throughout the rest of the compositing process. Where possible in your portfolio, you want to show that you have skills in image restoration, dust busting, wire removal, paint, and other replacement work and cleanup work. 
You should also highlight shots that show you are skilled in rotoscoping, keying, degrading, tracking and retiming. And they would all be useful skills for a junior compositor to be able to show. Often compositors will have to work with poor footage and rebuild it to suit the shot. If you want to show more advanced workflows, you could work with poorly shot footage and try and restore it or create mats for it quickly and accurately. This is not necessarily the glamorous stuff, but good quality mats and good quality plate restoration are vital for compositing. And there's a lot of this type of work to be done. By doing this, you're highlighting your keen observational and analytical skills, and you're highlighting that you have a meticulous nature with high standards. And they're really the kind of attributes you need to be a good compositor. If you have strong examples, uh, you could also highlight more advanced skills, uh, such as 2.5D projection, multi-pass compositing, and 2D effects work. If you, had a, if you had a lot of work and you were starting out, you might split the reels into a general comp reel, which shows the more advanced stuff. And a more specific reel for Roto and Paint is that's where a lot of the entry jobs pop up. When we look at building up an online presence, there's a few options for where we can post our work. Wherever we're going to post our work, we want to try and limit the amount of work that we show. So much like with the reel, you really do want to be showing your very best work. We don't want to be including filler or images to make up the numbers. Six awesome pieces are better than six awesome pieces plus four mediocre ones. Uh, we need to keep in mind that we're trying to highlight particular skill sets to an employer. Uh, and that's the purpose here. We should keep this in mind again when we're trying to choose work for our site. For, for any given piece, we want to be asking the question, what does this say about my skills? What problems am I demonstrating that I can solve for a prospective employer uh, with this particular image or this particular piece? Uh, keeping that in mind, where do we want to post our work? So to start off with, it can be quite worthwhile having your own site. And these are relatively easy to create through platforms like Wix, WordPress and Squarespace. So you don't need to spend a lot of time learning to code. Having your own professional site can be particularly important if you're looking for freelance or remote work. But it can also be useful for building up a professional reputation. The traffic will be lower than on a social media platform, but where possible, you can try and drive traffic from the more social sites towards your own site. You know, there is a cost towards having your own site. And if you were doing it, I would be looking at a proper domain name rather than one with Wix in the address or whatever is the flavor of the month for creating websites, as it looks more professional if you have a proper .com address. And now, outside of building your own site, you, can, you do see quite a lot of nice imagery up on social media platforms, such as Facebook and in particular Instagram. And these platforms can be particularly well suited to showing short video pieces and potentially more experimental work rather than more professional work. And you do see a lot of experimental work up on these sites. Uh, while Instagram and Facebook uh, can see a lot of hits, they are not professional design sites. Often videos on Instagram, for instance, are heavily compressed and that can often be a disservice to the fine detail in your work. The format and presentation of these sites are not really designed to highlight your work in the best particular way. Uh, I'm not saying not to use them, but I think you should be trying to drive traffic from here towards either a professional website or towards a more design oriented site. Some more design oriented social media platforms include Behance, which is a large design focused site owned by Adobe and has a wide range of 2D design and illustration work on it, as well as 3D work. For a more concept art and 3D oriented design platform, ArtStation is the flavor of choice these days. Uh, lots of high quality models, texture and concept work up on that site. Now ArtStation has a free design platform. It also has a pro version, which will allow you to build a more discreet and professional looking site. Now that has a cost to it. Now ArtStation is set up to allow you to show off various versions of your work. It allows you to present your work as collections so you can show breakdowns of work, allowing you the power to highlight details or specific skill sets that you want an employer to see. You can also use this to show the buildup of work over a period of time. It also allows the use of 3D players such as Marmoset and Sketchfab. Marmoset is a standalone piece of software that works very similar to a game engine and allows you to look dev your models within a game engine environment without having the overhead of having to learn the whole game engine. There is also another 3D player called Sketchfab and Sketchfab is a website where you can upload your 3D models and it will play in their geometry player. It has controls that allow you to turn on and off the various different maps that you use and to show your model under different rendering conditions. As well as being able to show off the wireframe, it also allows animation within the player. Uh, for particularly well done models, 
that you have, for example, models textured, rigged and animated, this could be a good way to show it off as well as high quality still renders. One thing that we do need to be a little bit wary of with uh, any of these sites uh, is that websites do not last forever. So it is important to keep local copies of your own work. There has been plenty of examples of professional design sites that have gone bust over the years and people have lost some of their portfolio work because that's the only place they stored it. So it is important to keep your own local version of work. Just to recap some of the tips that we've covered over this video and the previous video on presentation. We want to be ruthless when we're presenting our work for a portfolio. We want to show only the very best of the best. So tip number two is to keep it short. On the reel in particular, we want to start and end well. We have 30 seconds to make an impression. I would say the same thing for the site. The first two or three images an employer clicks on better be really top quality uh, and show off your skill sets to best effect. We want to try where we can to match our real and our site to, the, to a particular vacancies. Uh, and the best way to do that is to pay attention to junior entry level roles and what are the requirements. You want to make your role clear and you want to make it clear what you're passionate about and what you feel you're best skilled at. You can show your workings, you can show the breakdown of a shot. And again, we want to be selective where and when we do this, uh, but it can be quite effective to show how hard you work and to highlight particular things. Uh, in general, we want to keep things simple, in particular for the presentation. It is very important that your contact details work and are up to date. Technique beats originality. When someone is sitting down to view your reel, they're not looking to be entertained. They're looking to hire someone for a job. I would try and avoid thinking you need to break the mold. If you can do something simple and do it incredibly well, that is what employers are looking for. And just to follow up on that, then we want to try and avoid cliches. You definitely want to be staying away from anything that might be considered offensive. We do want to be aware of trends within demo rails, and there's definitely trends that you see come out every two or three years. So in general, you want to avoid dragons, robots, cameras, endlessly flying around. Uh, you want to try and generally avoid anatomically over-exaggerated humans. And manga heroes are probably things that you all want to avoid in general. So that wraps up the talk about content. And hopefully that's given you some things to think about as you go through your own content for your portfolio. That's my take on things. You obviously need to go and research. So you really want to see what else is out there and find something that you find inspiring and find something that you find is well put together. Where you can get feedback on your work. And there's some links there for various sites that you might be able to get feedback on. And then there's some other links down the bottom, which might give you some ideas for different types of reels, just to get you started on your own research. Uh, I've also included one last video in the slides, which is a quick talk by Sony Pictures Imageworks about what they look for in a reel. And again, you should find that a lot of it sounds familiar from the talks that we've been through. So thanks for listening and the very best of luck putting together your portfolio.